Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bazaar, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Tim! Tim! I caught you really making a racket with that lawnmower. It's six o'clock in the morning. Our guests of our friends here in Australia. Uh, did, did they ask you to help them out? But No, no. I'm trying to see if I can duplicate one of their saucer nests. The saucer nests were an early version of the crop circle phenomena. Rather crude ones, I would say, but uh, did, did they uh, get their point across? Do you, do you really think that they were made by an alien intelligence? I'm not an expert, but our guest tonight from the other side of the world is. It's something I hope we can get some answers to. Do. I would hope so, as you're really making quite a racket here. You might you might wake the kangaroos up. We don't want that to happen. Let's get back to the KCOR radio studio where we can do our research in peace and harmony. All right, this is Exploring the Bazaar. I'm Tim Swartz. I'm starting the show right now because Tim Beckley's having a... Uh, uh, a little problem uh, getting online, but uh, we should have him hopefully uh, uh, later on in the program. But uh, we'll just get right into it then and uh, introduce our guest, uh, Cheryl Gottschall. Now, uh, Cheryl is a return visitor uh, to our show and uh, just really absolutely happy to have us uh, have her with us now cheryl was born in uh, brisbane australia but at an early lay age lived on a cattle station in uh, country queensland where as a child she often looked at the stars like a lot of us and wondered if there was other life out there in the universe now in her teenage years she developed an interest in the paranormal and in 1988 she became an active ufo investigator for the uh, brisbane based organization ufo research queensland and has since held two terms as president for a total of 24 years so soon after joining the ufo rq cheryl had her own close encounter with the uh, commonly described gray alien uh, appearing to her in her home and this was followed by the development of a, a serious 10-year illness during which time she experienced a near-death experience uh, out-of-body experiences and other uh, mystical paranormal and uh, psychic phenomena her quest for what was happening to her led her on the path to shamanism and the understanding that these events were an invitation but more importantly an initiation into other realms populated by a variety of beings her personal experiences catapulted her into the world of shamanism and she, which she now uses and teaches uh, shamanic practices now in 1992 cheryl also established the, the first close encounter support group in brisbane after bud hopkins spoke uh, uh for the first time at a, a conference there so now while working as a dedicated researcher of the ufo mystery for 31 years cheryl organizes and speaks at monthly ufo meetings for ufo Re uh, research queensland and in addition she is a member of the International Association for Near-Death Studies uh, and, uh, and hosts monthly meetings and explores the afterlife. Now, Cheryl is a regular writer for the Australian bi-monthly publication, UFO Encounter. Uh, I think that uh, it's probably the, the, the last remaining uh, uh, English-written UFO magazine out there and uh, also the UFO Truth magazine uh, published in the UK. Uh, uh, UFO Truth magazine, is that still being published, uh, Cheryl? Yes, it is, yeah, um, but I'm, I'm no longer writing uh, purely because I just don't have the the time basically uh, yeah, i can i can understand that well uh, uh cheryl uh, thank you for being with us it's it's always great to have you on exploring the bazaar oh thank you very much i appreciate being asked back oh yeah no problem well um uh, and and i hope that uh, that that you're doing well i mean i know that uh the, the the huge fires that they were having there in, in australia were you know not close to you but uh 
you know, uh, people see that in the news and, you know, they're mm. like, you know, oh my gosh, it was, a, you know, is that anywhere near you? <laughs> yeah, yes, I know what you mean, but um, mm. there was still plenty of smoke to go around. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, here in the Midwest, uh, you know, we get a lot of thunderstorms and, and, and tornadoes and, uh, you know, I'll have people who will, you know, say like, oh my gosh, there was a, I saw there was a tornado in New Mexico. Are you all right? I live in Indiana. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, that, yeah that's quite a, that, that's quite a ways away all right so um uh hopefully tim beckley he's uh he's 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 writing uh, <laughs> asking where everybody is so i don't know if uh i think that uh, tina's trying to uh work it to get him online but uh let's uh let's start cheryl now i know that tim really wanted to talk about the uh the the famous or possibly the infamous uh uh tully ufo ness that's something that uh, has fascinated him uh, uh for a long time so uh why don't you let our audience know just a little bit about uh, uh, uh what the tully ufo nests were sure sure well um the, I guess the, um, there were a whole lot of incidents that occurred around the time in 1966 but this was one that really grabs people's attention. Um, it occurred in Tully on the 19th of January in 1966, and it was at 9am. Mm -hmm. And what happened, and, and Tully, let me just explain, Tully is uh, 1,500 kilometres north of where I am in Brisbane, and that's about, you know, about an 18-hour drive, drive on the roads up north. Um, so it's in, it's in far north Queensland and in a very tropical zone. But the actual incident, um, which, by the way, I have to say also, um, I'd like to give some credit to a UFO researcher who's now passed on. Her name was Claire Noble. Mm -hmm. And Claire was also went on to help um, uh, one of the witnesses um, collect more information and document um, further, further source and nests that were found on his property. But this, this actually started with a gentleman uh, called George Pedley, and he was a banana farmer at a place called Uremo near the town of Tully. And so at 9 a.m. on that day, he was driving his tractor across the property of his neighbour's um, cane farm, and his neighbour his neighbor was called uh, um, Albert Panisi. Anyway, the farm track ran alongside a location known as Horseshoe Lagoon, and it was called that due to the shape of the lagoon. Anyway, the lagoon covered about a half an acre. I think that's about 2,000 square metres. Um, it was almost dry three months of the year on a regular basis. Mm. Um, it had little or no bird life around it. Maybe an ibis or two was seen here or there. But anyway, in the December, the month before, they'd had uh, good rain. So by January, when the main incident occurred, um, the lagoon was half filled, uh, maybe um, 30 metres uh, across at its widest point. Anyway, the greater part of the lagoon was covered with a thick growth of water reeds whose stems were about half an inch and they protruded above the water to an average height of about two feet. So you've got this big open area, a, a watery lagoon and reeds um, protruding out of the top of it. And the entire lagoon was green and lush until the day of that incident. So what happened was George was driving um, his tractor uh, 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 as he approached the lagoon and he heard a noise. So he leaned forward in his seat to listen um, and he thought the, because he thought the motor was misfiring. Anyway, and he almost immediately heard a hissing sound. So he's got his head down listening to this. So he initially thought, oh, a tyre was punctured and it was leaking air. But then, to his astonishment, he saw a large saucer shape rise from the lagoon. And George was facing the object with his back to the sun. So he had a clear, unimpeded view of it. Nothing was shining, no sunlight, sun was shining his eyes, nothing was being misinterpreted. He was getting a good, close, clear view of what he was seeing. And this saucer shaped object moved directly upwards for approximately 60 feet. Uh, it tilted slightly and then it veered off in the southwest at a, a really great speed. Mm. Now, 
the event, the entire event only took about four to five seconds. But if you count out five seconds and imagine this object rising up in front of you to about 60 feet, tilting slightly and then just taking off, you can still um, imagine that you can get a, you can really eyeball what you're seeing in front of you because when you're seeing something spectacular like that, your your mind is is taking in a lot more information than it ordinarily would because this is something so vastly unusual, you know. Anyway, um, George estimated the distance of the object from him. It was only about um, 22 metres, hmm. so he got a good look at it mm-hmm. and he described it as about 25 feet in diam- diameter, uh, about nine feet thick in the centre, silvery grey and had a really sharp outline. So he jumps from his tractor, runs across to the lagoon and pushing his way through six to seven foot tall sword grass on the lagoon's edge. And he immediately sees in the middle of the reeds a large circular area devoid of reeds. And then he further saw near the edge of the still slowly swirling water a patch of giant water cooch grass. Uh, And people might not be aware of this. It was about a square yard of which had apparently been clipped short and the clippings were removed. Anyway, he returns to his tractor and he restarts the motor and he goes on his way. Then later that morning, he came back past the lagoon and on further inspection, he sees for the first time the floating mass of reeds now on the surface of the lagoon. And the the reeds were radially distributed in a noticeably anti-clockwise uh, manner, like like the crop circles that you were used to hearing about in the UK. Right. And the reeds in the nest, um, as, as it had come to be called, which what we, they got called here in Queensland anyway, mm-hmm. they were still green, just like the other reeds in the lagoon. And after the object had risen, the reeds were still green. But when George returned in the afternoon, they appeared to be dry and browned off, which is really interesting because it was only about like 12 hours later and they'd completely died off. Anyway, so by this time, George thinks, well, I better tell someone else what's going on here. <laughs> so, I mean, I, th- I think I would have told him a bit earlier. So, he, anyway, he goes off to alert the property owner, Albert Panisi. So... Um, Mid-afternoon, they both returned to the lagoon, <clears throat> which, by the way, was uh, about one and a quarter miles from the Panisi house. Anyway, Albert decides to swim around the lagoon and he discovers that he can swim underneath the massive reeds since they are no longer attached to the, to the bottom of the lagoon. And uh, he finds that the water is quite clear. Anyway, the mat of reeds is now floating on the water's surface Uh, And that mat is about 18 inches thick. Now, the other thing that some people may not be aware of um, is that when they inspected the surrounding area, they found markings leading from the lagoon to the loose ploughed soil in the adjoining paddock. And these were described as being about three to four inches long and approximately two inches across at the widest point. And they were spaced about 12 inches apart and in a direct line, as if one one's walking, you know, um, uh, one immediately behind the other. So, um, anyway, samples of the reeds from both inside and outside of the nest were taken, and they were sent to the University of Queensland in Brisbane to check for, for radiation. They all proved negative except for one exception, which was the sample taken from the centre of the nest that showed a small increase in the beta range, um, but it was so small, it was only equivalent to 1% of the reading, reading taken from a dial on a wristwatch. So it's, you know, that could be easily explained by a variation in the normal background radiation, who knows really, but mm-hmm. they thought there was nothing there that was outstanding. So anyway, they had further tests, and this is where it gets a bit interesting because Um, They wanted to determine why the reeds had rapidly browned off within a 12-hour period. And the results were that the reeds died from natural processes, probably hastened by submersion due to flooding, but there'd be no flooding, you see. Mm -hmm. So anyway, whoever was doing the the samples, they dumped them in the bin after that. Um, uh, But there was no explanation given as to why all the other reeds in the lagoon remained green and healthy. So the 
people invest from our, my organisation, UFO Research Queensland, which in those days was called the Queensland Flying Saucer Research Bureau, um, they decided to do their own tests and they asked Albert to take water from the lagoon, add a quantity of fresh green reeds, complete with roots and completely submerge them in a large drum. And then the drum was then left standing on the banks of the lagoon in full sunlight and they examined it daily. Um, it was three full days before the first signs of browning became evident and seven days passed before the decaying process became obvious. So it seems that those reeds that had browned off so quickly um, had done so in response to something. Uh, even though the the tests at the University of Queensland said, you know, they, they basically discarded uh, discarded and said, oh, it's just just natural, just just died because they were submersed in flooded water, which there was, you know, which didn't happen to the rest of the reeds. Right. So um, unfortunately for Albert, like there were his his um, his uh, farm was completely overrun by the public and other people wanting to come and investigate um, you could, you could for, tell from for the quite newspaper, a while. Uh, you could tell from the newspaper cuttings. Uh, yes, I mean, which absolutely. All, yeah, yeah, all, all over. Uh, now, you know, I missed yep. the first a few minutes of the uh, of the show. Were, were there, uh, I remember when this uh, case broke, but were there any UFO sightings um, associated uh, with this nest? Yes, well, that's where he, where, um, uh, Albert actually saw a UFO rising from above where the nest was and ah, uh, and tilting okay. slightly and flying off at a fast speed. But he, his mm -hmm. wasn't the only case, but I can tell you a bit more about that in a minute. But yes. the other okay. interesting part of this was that um, after the media had published the first lot of uh, botanical findings, findings, the RAAF claimed to have also done testing but and they'd found similar results. Uh, with the addition that the nest could have been by caused by so-called whirlywinds. Well, you know, it wasn't, obviously. Um, so the the main incident happened on the Wednesday. The following Monday, the RAAF makes the statement that the nest was most pos uh, possibly caused by a hovering RAAF helicopter. Mm. But then the following day, the RAAF states there are no force Air Force helicopters in the area. So they weren't getting their story straight, basically. Uh, usual cover-up. Mm -hmm. The usual cover-up, but there's much more to <laughs> more cover-up that went on with this case because um, because of the increase in activity in Queensland at the time, um, the UFO Research Queensland um, decided to place two magnetic monitoring devices fitted with cameras in two locations in Queensland, and one of them was at Tully um, near the lagoon. So um, the, apparently what happened was it, that device was triggered. It registered that it had recorded something. It was posted to Kodak in Melbourne, that film. 14 days later, the sender received a letter from Kodak stating that the film case had arrived, but it was empty. Huh. Oh, boy. So, <laughs> you know, we've heard that before. And there's, oh, there's yeah. other cases, other ca many other cases like that um, of missing films and photos and I've just got a couple here that I've gathered. Um, mm -hmm. In 19, 1953, nine photos were taken at Port Moresby of a UFO. This is in Papua New Guinea, of a UFO. The photographer was Mr Drury, and some people might know this as the Drury film. Um, it was a very senior official of the Civil Aviation Department, and the five best shots that he took were lost by the authorities, lost in inverted commas. Um, in, then in 1954... 200 photos were taken with both film and still cameras by three young men who were driving near the West and South Australian border and were paced for 45 minutes by a UFO. They used all the film they had with five cameras. The film was borrowed by the, borrowed, again, mm. in inverted commas, by the RAAF, and, of course, they were never returned. And there's two, two other cases, one in 1961, a UFO was observed in brilliant sunshine by scores of North Queenslanders and photographed by a journalist from the Cairns Post newspaper. So he said a, fi um, a five, three, 
5 by 3 negative was sent to Kodak of Melbourne by um, a senior astronomer who he sent it to from the Mount Stromlo Observatory in Canberra. And not surprisingly, they denied ever receiving it too. Of course. Yeah. And then in the last case, it was um, in 1965, several photographs were taken by a pilot from the ANSET airline over Bougainville Reef in the Solomon Sea en route to Port Moresby from Townsville, which is in North in Queensland. His aircraft was being paced by a UFO. On returning to Townsville, the pilot was met on arrival and flown directly to Canberra with his camera and the aircraft's black box. The radio man at the Townsville airport was transferred to Darwin the following week, but I can't find any documentation stating what happened to the pilot after that. Mm. But anyway, these are some case, some examples of not only the, um, the Tully film, but also other, you know, it was common practice in those days for photographs and films to be, uh, I guess, you know, uh, taken and um, and not returned so that the RAAF could, could analyse, you know, to see what was going on for themselves. Well, we had a famous case here, uh, uh, Rex Heflin, who was, a, I think, a county worker uh, doing some survey work or doing some road work, and he took mm -hmm. a series of uh, photographs in California and, and Tim, didn't the photographs disappear for, what, a decade or, or, or more? And they finally ended up in Ann Druffles, I think, uh, a mailbox uh, 15 years later. Right, mm. right. Yeah, at least mm. tw at least 20 years they disappeared. Yeah, at least yeah, 20 years they disappeared, yeah. Mm. But uh, there's a bit more story, a bit more of a story to the Cully, Tully case um, because um, – what, there was another thing that happened on the 8th of February 1969 uh, when this um, device that had been set up to, to be able to monitor, you know, anything that was going on in the area, um, it had been set up in Albert's son's bedroom. I'm guessing it was because it was the best location to face that particular area. I'm not really sure why. It's not quite clear in our records, but... Anyway, Albert's son, Shane, he was woken by the UFO monitoring device, which had a buzzer. And um, he turned it off thinking to tell his father about it at breakfast, but Albert had already gone out the house earlier. And Shane forgot to tell him um, until he came home. And um, anyway, so as soon as he found out, he Albert gets, you know, gets in his tractor and drives out to the lagoon and discovers a new saucer nest. Now, this one was 29 and a half feet in diameter and perfectly circular. There were also reeds floating on the surface, again, in a clockwise direction. And on further inspection, another smaller nest was discovered at the extreme north end of the lagoon, and that was uh, 12 feet in diameter. And it had all the characteristics of the larger one. So, and then about 25 feet away from the new nest, and about 15 feet above ground level, there's a protruding branch of a tree. And this branch has an area of leaves about six feet long, about two feet deep, and they're scorched. And the leaves are crisp and they're curled up, showing signs of browning. There were no tracks to or, or from the tree. Um, and uh, so more testing was carried out by the University of Queensland once again, which concluded that Due to the nature of the specimens tested, um, oh sorry, not, that wasn't carried out on on that tree. It was on the um, samples from the nest, the second nest. Uh, they said that the nature of the specimens tested, it would have been expected that they would still be green alive, but nearly all of the specimens were dead and starting to decompose. So um, yeah, it was just a whole lot of things didn't add up properly. There was, um, you know, there was things going on in the area. It wasn't the only case. Things went on um, just prior and for a while after. And I remember Claire, before she passed, some years back actually, she told me that, you know, she'd collected uh, well over 100 cases um, from the, the Tully area of these nests that had been found on the ground. And All right, I've, Cheryl, let me, let me interrupt you here because we have to go to our bottom of the hour break. When we come back, we will continue our conversation with Cheryl Gottschall on Exploring the Bazaar. So stay tuned for more. Now back to Exploring the Bazaar. 
with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal. Your hosts, Timothy, Timothy Beckley, Beckley and Tim Swartz. All right. Welcome back to Exploring the Bazaar. Uh, our guest tonight is uh, Cheryl Gottschall and uh, Tim Beckley. I'm glad to see that you were able to uh, get wow. your uh, your uh, internet problems uh, solved. And uh, well, I, 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 I tell you, it's been a difficult uh, three or four uh, days. Uh, I haven't even been able to to eat much in the the way of uh, food. Actually, that's uh, not too good. Uh, you don't have you don't have the uh, coronavirus, do you? Oh, I don't, you know, I'm so old, Tim. I think I might have the swine flu. No, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. So, uh, Tim, do you want to uh, do you want to uh, carry on with the uh, conversation here? Carry on, that, yes, uh, carry on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, uh, Cheryl, uh, they seem that UFOs. They seem to be interested in the. A floral makeup uh, of uh, uh, Earth. Maybe they're checking for radioactivity in the atmosphere or something. But you've got cases there in Australia where these things have come and, and apparently even come down and, and landed uh, uh, in the uh, tip top of of trees or pretty darn close to it. Mm, yeah, um, I do think I, um, I do think that they are definitely interested in our flora and fauna. I have had people tell me that um, they've seen in the distance UFOs, uh, and this is up in North Queensland again, one in one case was where it was on the ground and these small beings were sort of walking around. Um, he was quite frightened. He was off in the bush. Um, I think he was treating um, noxious weeds or something at the time, and he was watching them. And uh, they did seem to be uh, collecting things off the ground. And... I mean, we've heard that worldwide. That's that's nothing new, you know. That I remember. There's a case in the United States um, in the 19, oh, in Canada actually in the 1930s where um, they were they were seen to be doing this sort of thing too. So um, yeah, it's I'm sure that they would come here and just like we would if we were on another planet, we'd be picking up samples to analyze and test and see what use we could make of them too. I suppose. Well, I, I know one of the first cases that Bud Hopkins, the uh, late abduction researcher, investigated was the case over in uh, New Jersey where this fellow on the way home from uh, work happened to see a UFO uh, in uh, across from the Stonehenge uh, Henge apartment building, if that is a synchronicity. Uh, it was a craft that had landed, had a couple of tri uh, tripod landing gear. A couple of aliens came out and seemed to be scooping up the soil before they uh, disappeared. And uh, Tim, in, uh, in your incredible... Uh, Alien Encounters book, uh, we talk about a case, I think it's right there in your home state of uh, Indiana, where a young fellow saw a uh, saw and photographed a uh, an object that landed in a tree in his yard or his neighbor's yard. Yeah, it uh, it didn't land in the trees. It uh, and this was in nineteen sixty seven in uh, Milan, Indiana, um, where this uh, uh, UFO, which uh, looked like an old fashioned uh, um, um, uh, cow uh, milk jug, uh, was floating past his uh, his bedroom window, uh, kind of like uh, uh, above and through the trees. And uh, the odd thing about it, and, and he did manage to uh, take a couple of, of uh, color 35 uh, millimeter uh, photographs, but the odd thing about it was that uh, the next day, uh, a lot of, uh, of branches of these uh, trees that this thing came close to had withered and died. So, I mean, very similar to uh, what, uh, what had happened to the, the reeds there in uh, Tully. For sure. Mm. Hey, I, I wanted to change the, the subject a little bit here. Uh, what is with mysterious pregnancies? Uh, missing pregnancies. Missing pregnancies. Okay. Missing pregnancy cases, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've heard a few of those over the years, and, and not just in Australia but all around the world, actually. And um, there was a case here that um, involved a woman that I've known for a quite a long time, and... She was working at um, uh, on the Gold Coast, and um, 
there was sort of like a lead up to this, okay? It's not just a, like a, suddenly you're pregnant and, yeah. and then you're not and there's a whole story mm-hmm. around it. But just to keep it as brief as I can, um, what happened leading up to this experience was that she was driving um, the same way to and from work every day. And that particular night she left work about 7 p.m. And she was walking across the car park towards her car when she saw the brightest star she had ever seen. Anyway, it was so bright and beautiful she couldn't take her eyes off it. And for some really weird reason, she suddenly became very emotional and she started to cry. Anyway, she quickly got into a car. She could see about five other people in the car park who also saw this bright light or star. And they were commenting on its brightness as well. Anyway, she drove out of the car park, began a journey home. The next thing she remembers is pulling over to the side of the road, feeling very disoriented and wondering where the heck she was and how she got there. Um... It took her minutes to get her bearings. Then she drove home, annoyed with herself for driving in such a confused and and irresponsible manner, she thought. Anyway, she arrives home. She's still quite emotional. She walks inside. Husband wants to know where she was because she was over an hour and a half late. So she's running around checking the clocks going, oh, my gosh, you know, like, that can't be right. I've only just left work and it takes me so long to get home. I can't be an hour and a half late, but turns out she was. But this was just sort of like the beginning of what was going on for her because after that they decided to go on a holiday and they are going to go up to um, North Queensland or central North Queensland to do some fossicking. Anyway, um, before she went though, she um, she found that uh, she – now let me get my, my story straight here. She discovered that she was pregnant. That's right. Um, she already had two children. Um, but she really wanted to have this baby. and um, But she had concerns that something didn't feel right. She had a terrible feeling that she was going to lose this baby. But anyway, um, about two weeks later, she develops gynecological problems, thinks she's going to lose the baby. Uh, according to the doctor, everything was all right, and she was about six weeks pregnant. So they decided to go off on this, this Foster King holiday. And um, so... She started to have some more problems where she thought she might, you know, she was starting to have a bit of spotting. She thought she might have a miscarriage or something. Anyway, but she kept that to herself because she really wanted to go on this holiday. I don't know if I would have done that, but anyway. So they took off, um, stayed in a motel. They were heading towards Cairns in north, north Queensland, far north Queensland, when her husband strangely decides to take a detour west um, and um, they arrive at a place called Sapphire. It's about 4.30 in the afternoon. Now, this is in 1988, mind you. Mm. So um, as they're driving around looking for somewhere to stay, the husband turns down a dirt road, and he quite suddenly, with no warning, um, the car broke down. So it's 5 p.m., they're miles from nowhere. The husband starts tinkering, tinkering with the engine, and she walks over the hill to see if there's anything in the area um, that – you know, basically could help them. So she sees a sign on a tree and it said with an arrow saying sunrise cabins uh, this way. So she goes up there. Uh, she finds a, a, a holiday area. It's got, I think it's got caravans and a motel or something and some, some tents that have been set up. So she, she books a tent. They, anyway, they camp there for the night basically. She's there laying in the tent looking at the flap of the tent into the night sky, thinking how beautiful it was. And suddenly she sees a very bright light and thinks it looks like the same light or star she saw previously in the year. Anyway, she's watching it. It's getting closer. And then she sees boomerang-shaped objects coming out of this light. And her last thought, she said, was, my God, if these are what I think they are, then UFOs are real because I'm wide awake and I'm really seeing this. Anyway, I mean, I could just put myself in her situation. I can imagine, you know, what she was going through. But anyway, she describes everything then changing. She's suddenly no longer in the tent. She has no idea where or how she got there. Um, and she didn't care either. She had absolutely no fear, which is um, really odd. But that's what happens in some of these cases, these close encounter cases. Fear just seems to disappear. She finds herself standing on a deserted street um, that appeared to be L-shaped. There were no people or cars on this road. Uh, it was night. She's standing under a lamppost, and there's another lamppost on the so- other side of the road. 
Anyway, um, at the corner of the street, there appears to be a country and western tavern with lots of people. And somehow she knew her husband was in there as well. So at this stage, it seems to me while she's telling me her story that some sort of scenario has been set up for her to be mm. placed there. Because remember, she's in the outback here, okay? There's nothing else around. So anyway. Um, Except the for the Min Min lights. Well, yes, there could be some of those. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But anyway, the street's totally deserted and uh, she, she knew that she was waiting for someone. She's feeling very excited, almost ecstatic. And then a silver vehicle, like a car, comes towards her from the sky and it lands in front of her. And she describes it as having no wheels, doors or roof. It seems to hover just slightly off the ground. And in the vehicle were very four, uh, were four very human-like beings. And they're all male and one of them was holding a small child. And they're all dressed the same, including the child, in silvery skin-tight one-piece suits. And even the boots they had on seemed to be part of the, the suit. Anyway, so they, they've come to reassure her, to show her this child who is, they alleged, her unborn son. And, um, and she, you know, they wanted her to hold it all. She wanted to hold it, can't quite remember now. But first she has to undergo this detoxification process. So this... One of them has like a backpack on it and it has a spray nozzle and it sprays her down and um, she's immediately wet and then she's immediately all dry. So there's some sort of contamination purification, anti-contamination purification process that she's gone through. And um, anyway, so she's holding the child. She feels connected to it. Um, meanwhile, her husband walks past and says, uh, look, sweetheart, this is our son, isn't he? Beautiful. But he just keeps on walking past her as if he's in a daze. Anyway, um, so they brought the child to her to, to, to um, reassure her that the child that she's going to have is going to be okay, not to worry, there's nothing wrong with her. Um, and, and that goes on for a bit uh, for a while. Anyway, eventually the child's given back to the beings and um, she watches the silvery vehicle go back up into the sky and disappear over the treetops. Anyway, the next thing, she's back in the tent, seeing all the boomerang-shaped objects going back into the bright light. When the last one entered, a very loud noise started and her husband sat up in bed and was pulling at her to get up and have a look at this herd of wild horses that he's imagined stampeding through the camping area. Um mm. But she, she just says she feels paralysed. She, she couldn't move a muscle. And um, before the noise, um, but the noise just keeps getting, uh, keeps going until eventually she drags herself up to see what was going on. I need to hear her husband say, oh, too late. You missed it. Go back to sleep, which she instantly did. But anyway, finally getting to the missing pregnancy. But I just wanted to give you the background of that particular case. The next morning, she has a nagging feeling that something had happened through the night, but she couldn't remember what. So she put it down to one of those dreams that you have, but you can't remember. Goes and has a shower, returns to her husband, and he, he says, did you hear the racket those horses made last night when they came stampeding through here? Of course, that triggers her memory, and she immediately remembers everything that happened the night before. Now... Five days after that experience, she miscarries, uh, has a miscarriage while she's still on the holidays, but the doctors the doctors couldn't find a fetus, so she, they assumed she had lost it before arriving at the hospital. Now, it took nearly four hours to get to the hospital from where they were, so if she'd lost anything, it would have been in the car, which it wasn't. Anyway, when she told them she was nine weeks pregnant by then, they told her she must be mistaken because the doctor said, you've gone through an actual labour and with the amount of afterbirth present, um, she would have had to be no less than 14 weeks pregnant, which she found impossible to believe. Mm. So two months after that miscarriage, she falls pregnant again, gives birth to a son and who is the exact duplicate from her description of the child that she had held during that close encounter. Wow. That, that's very strange, but not dissimilar uh, to other cases that we've investigated. Uh, we have a, uh, a lady here, uh, Krista Tilton, 
who has had uh, missing uh, uh, fetuses. Uh, we wrote her story up along with many others in our Sexter Terrestrials uh, the, uh, book, which has got like you know 350 pages of uh, 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 data on, on uh, similar uh, episodes uh, uh, like this. So something strange mm-hmm. is going on. I mean, it, it, yes. it, it seems, uh, I, it, you know, I mean, it's hard to believe that there could be crossbreeding uh, like that. I mean, they would have mm. to be very, very closely related to, to us, I would think, in order to produce uh, the children. Well, to be honest, I, I could say, or a skeptic could say, well, that's an assumption, uh, because yeah. we, we actually don't really know what they're doing. I mean, we have people who report close encounters who say that they're part of a, a breeding program, and I get yes. that, and, and I can see why they would interpret the information like that. And you've got to remember that when people have these reports and they and they tell us, it, you know, I, I always say that some of these aliens are master mental manipulators, and they can put well, information. They are. They are yep, indeed. Yep. Yes. They can put information into our mind and make us think and feel anything, in some yep. cases. So, um, you know, it's. You know, maybe that's going on. Maybe there's something else. I really don't know. I just, I'm just can't say 100 percent either way. Mm-hmm. Now, you you talk about a case of a missing time of a police trainee. Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Now, this was. Um, let me see. This was with a gentleman that we interviewed um, late last year, and. This is, again, going back some years, all these cases that are really uh, uh, cases that are full of uh, detail, rich with detail, these go back many years. We're not getting those cases these days, right? But um, so this occurred in 1976, and he was uh, at the Green Bank military base, and that's not too far from where I am, actually, probably about a 15-minute drive. Anyway, in 1976, he was a trainee police officer training in bush rescue at the Green Bank area. And it's a live training facility. It's about 46 square kilometres for the Australian Defence Force, okay? And um, it's located 25 kilometres south of Brisbane. Anyway, the trainees at the time, they were being trained by an Army Reserve officer um, and they were given a grid map and told they had to find their way to another grid in a certain time. The maximum time was 45 minutes that people had done it in. Most people did it in 30. Anyway, the group was divided into three squads, and uh, this guy, I'll call his name Steve, uh, his squad made it in the allotted time. But another squad got completely lost. And even though they had a map and compasses, they went missing for three hours long enough to trigger a search for them. Now, Steve was personally involved in the search, driving in all-terrain vehicles looking for the group. And when they eventually turned up, they were told that they'd been missing for three hours. And the squad said, oh, come on, we've been gone for 25 minutes because they thought they'd actually beaten everybody. Anyway, when they were asked what they were doing, They replied, nothing out of the ordinary, just going from point A to point B like we were instructed. Um, When they asked what terrain they covered, they pointed it out, um, they pointed them out, but the other squads had looked for them in those spots, but they couldn't find anyone. So they'd already covered that area. Anyway, as a result, that squad was subsequently spirited away and the other squad members weren't allowed to speak to them for a while. And eventually they did, but the missing squad gave what Steve interpreted, he said, sounded like scripted replies, keeping to their story. He said, you can tell when people have been are telling you something that they've been told to tell you. Anyway, when the squad members were leaving the camp, unidentifiable people turned up wearing suits. So they didn't know what that was about. But anyway, some years later in 1985, Steve was in the Army Reserve and, again, on the same base, and they had a lot of malfunctioning equipment, anything from rifles to radios, and his own rifle would jam, even though he was really meticulous with it, cleaning it, stripping it down all the time, as everyone had to do. It was an SLR rifle. They all had those, uh, which are an extremely reliable rifle. 
Um, a couple of other people had the same problem uh, with their rifles. Curiously, the radio operator would report his radio would just stop working. But as soon as he came out of, uh, the oper uh, out of the operation, his radio would function fully. The battery wasn't drained. Its functionality was just suspended. And the same occurred with vehicles where they would just die and then they would start again. And at times, Stephen said he had trouble with, concent with his own concentration and other people did too. They were talking about that. And there was a certain no-go area which was deep in the base where all this would occur. So there are some really strange things going on there, but a group of a group of people in the earlier part, they had that three hours of missing time. That is that is bizarre. Uh, Cheryl, we've, we've only got about uh, three minutes left in the show, but uh, really quick, uh, uh, Jeremy from the uh, Las Vegas UFO Hunters wants to know if uh, the, the number or frequency of UFO si uh, sightings, have they increased or decreased uh, uh, since the recent fires in Australia? Um, decreased. But decreased. They, were, they were low before that. There's not been a lot happening here. Uh, for quite some years, it's been it's just gone into that cycle, that lull cycle, which mm -hmm. which does happen with this phenomenon from time to time. Um, but um, there has been something. Um, there were a couple of reports came in where someone had sent some video footage in where we thought there could it could be some sort of genuine UFO that was again um, north of Brisbane. Uh, but generally, everything's pretty quiet. All right. Well, why don't you let our audience know really quick uh, uh, where they can find out uh, more about you, uh, where uh, websites, things like that. Sure. Okay. Well, um, our website is uh, UFO Research Queensland. But uh, for anyone who's interested in, particularly in the Tully case, you can go to our YouTube channel. Just search for UFO Research Queensland YouTube channel. And um, you'll find the you'll find um, a recording of Albert Panisi talking at our fiftieth anniversary conference in two thousand and six, talking all about the Tully case there too. We've also got a Facebook page um, again, UFO Research Queensland. You can go on there and um, get the that's where I post all the any sort of news and Australian news and sightings, and I stick just to Australian material on there. So anyone who wants to know uh, what's happening in this part of the world, they can they jump on there and have a look. Well, you also have a very readable magazine. Yes, we do. Yes, UFO Encounter. Oh. That comes oh, it's, out it's, twice. It's one, yes, it's one, it's one of the best, very easy to read, and it, it's not uh, printed on go a gaudy yellow background with purple type and stuff like that. <laughs> 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 very, very, very easy to read and very enjoyable and some very, very – uh, important um, uh, articles. Anyway, it's yeah. been a pleasure to talk uh, to talk with you again, and uh, I, I will follow up in a, in a couple of months and see what's uh, 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 cooking. And uh, in the uh, meantime, don't forget our YouTube uh, channel, Mister UFO Secret File. And this week, Tim, what book did we release? The uh, Paul this, Villa story. That's right, Secret UFO Contacts of Paul Villa on Amazon right now. All color, all color, every page. <laughs> Good night, all. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. Pleasant dreams. Yes, thank you. You've been listening to Exploring the Bazaar with hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. They're taking back the night by jetting non stop across the cosmos in search of the truly bizarre and totally unexplained, with you as their co pilot. Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. For more information on exploring the bazaar and hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz, check out their KCOR Digital Radio Network. Follow their YouTube channel at MRUFO1100. Exploring the bazaars.